Good afternoon. It has now been nearly four days since a deadly shooting at a home in Englewood. One man was arrested for shooting at police who'd responded to a 911 call. The man's brother was killed after police fired back. Englewood's police chief won't take our questions on camera, but he did release a video statement today. Nine News reporter Noel Brennan found out information coming from police right now has been limited and conflicting. We can lay out pieces of the story, but the full picture of what happened on South Grove Street is incomplete. We know Philip Blankenship is accused of shooting at Englewood police. Officers fired back and Blankenship's younger brother, Matthew Mitchell, was killed. Pieces of the story come from Englewood Police, a news release, an arrest report. I'm Sam Watson, police chief for the Englewood Police Department. And a Although taped statement from the chief. The news release says responding officers were, quote, met with gunfire. But the shooting wasn't so sudden if you read the arrest report. It says officers set a perimeter and made loud commands for Blankenship to exit the house. The video statement offers a timeline, suggesting officers were on scene 28 minutes before the first shot. Enough time for police to get two family members out of the house. At 8.07, officers were shot at from a large window on the east side of the house. That gunfire struck a vehicle that the officers were positioned behind. The news release and arrest report do not make clear whether police knew Matthew Mitchell was inside the house with his brother when officers fired. But the chief's words suggest they did. Officers then surrounded the house and started making announcements for both occupants to exit the residence. We know the story ends with gunfire. It was determined that the subject was deceased. This all started with a 911 call about a family disturbance. Police say that Blankenship told them that he was suicidal and his brother never shot at police. Englewood's police chief says officers were wearing body cameras at the time of the shooting. He says those recordings will show the extreme risk officers and the community faced. We still have not seen a single frame of that video. The police chief says that it will be released when the investigation allows it to be released. These situations are often confusing and sometimes the facts do move a little bit, but we've seen varied reports as you just told us. Yeah, the initial statement that they were met with gunfire, the Video statement from police chief today contradicts that and says that, yeah, there was a significant period of time that passed before shots were actually fired. And, and sometimes when you just release a video statement, that only causes us to point out all these things that, so they Absolutely. definitely if we were are going to have, have to get that video a back and forth with them. to answer, yeah, a little bit more. There will be a comprehensive report. We'll still wait for that, see when that comes out. Yeah, there's the 18th Judicial critical incident response team that is looking into this. So we'll just have to wait and see what their, their report finds. Kind of lay out all the details of what all right. happened. Thank you, Noel. Thanks, Noel. Well, again, last night we saw a major storm sweeping across Colorado. One viewer, Kathy, sent us this video last night. You see the clouds swirling above a neighborhood. This is in Severance, up between Greeley and Fort Collins. She says several homes in her neighborhood are going to need plenty of repair because of some golf ball sized hail. Then you look at Wellington to the northwest where they got tennis ball sized hail in some spots there. And in Estes Park, the hail came down hard and fast. Yeah, it looked like snow, it looked like a blizzard right there right before 10 last night. They actually had to bring out the snow plows to clear the roads once the storm kind of cooled off this morning. Flash flooding happens fast and one reporter has witnessed the tragedy that it brings over and over in his 31 years as a journalist in Fort Collins. Yeah, he spoke with our reporter Katie Eastman about uh, days like today and how they take him back. As the skies lit up overnight and the rain poured over northern Colorado this morning, people in Fort Collins remembered a day exactly 25 years ago on July 28th. 1997 in the trailer in the trailer it was a night of terror at a trailer park and uh, i can remember walking from my home and in, uh, in two blocks i could barely get back because the water was about uh, uh, almost up to my knee already miles bloomhart was in his early reporting days at the colorado in then i was asleep when i woke up and now everything was floating away but the details of the spring creek flood that killed five people never go away especially not on days like this. Larimer County has, you know, a history with flash floods. We've had the last six fatalities in, in the state, four last year and two this year. This morning's rain caused some streets to flood in Fort Collins. So far, nothing too serious. 
but because Bloomhart knows what can happen, he hopes others pay attention. Um, so today, I think we're at risk because if we do get some of these heavier rains, which we've already had this morning, um, I think there's some potential for not only not only flash flooding up in the uh, the Cameron uh, Peak burn scar, but also here in Fort Collins. Katie Eastman, Nine News. And what he says is true. So many people remember these storms. There is a flat flash flood watch in effect until 10 tonight in Fort Collins. Stay tuned. Certainly one of those important days for people to be paying attention to the weather. Whereas if you look over Denver right now, just been a cooler day with some cloud cover, but some very important forecasting lies ahead. So we want to check in right now with uh, Lauren Robinson and the Weather Center to find out how things are shaping up. Hi, Lauren. Hi, well, we are already seeing those storms mostly along the high country, and we even have a couple flash flood warnings in effect. So let's go ahead and go straight to our HD Doppler radar, where you can see all of those storms again in the mountain regions, off to some portions of the western slope. But as we zoom in to where we have those flash flood warnings that have already been issued, that's going to be those purple polygons where all of these storms are starting to push into. So that's going to be Larimer County. That's the one a little bit to the right, north uh, northeast a little bit. And uh, that one's expected to last until around 5 45 and then we have a newer one over the uh, East Troublesome Burn area that's going to be Grand County and so we're going to watch for that one until 645. So these storms are continuing to pour down a lot of rain in a short amount of time. So we're going to continue to watch for these flood alerts. We even have these larger flood alerts, the flood watch until 10 o'clock as well as a flash flood watch until 10 o'clock and that's going to be simply put for the majority of Colorado. So really no matter where you are, you're going to watch for these stronger storms to push through. So we have a marginal risk for severe weather mostly along the I 25 corridor and into the front range. So our biggest threat going to be the heavy downpours. Outside of that, we're going to continue to watch for lightning, strong winds and even hail as we go through the rest of the evening. So I'll have more details on that plus your full seven day forecast just ahead. Day two for those counting um, of training camp and before training camp today, Justin Simmons and Russell Wilson got to say hello to some friends. A group from the Boys and Girls Club of Denver sitting on the hill there. They jogged over, give them some fist bumps, some high fives, put some smiles in their faces as well. Before they return to the field, Boys and Girls Club, of course, close to the Denver Broncos and their charities. Justin Simmons wasn't the only player to have some fun with the fans. Kicker Brandon McManus threw a few catches to the fans there watching camp back and forth. For those who remember, Brandon was the last member of this current team to play with the old Peyton Manning man. Yeah, he is. That Super Bowl season. Last Super Bowl guy left. Wide receiver Jerry Judy also took time to meet the man who owns all of the Broncos receiving records, the Ring of Famer Rod Smith. Judy and Smith took this photo together. Hopefully the young receiver was paying attention. Whereas Judy was a high first round pick, Rod Smith was undrafted out of college before going on to a 14 year career, which included two Super Bowls, 1997 and 1998. Our Broncos insider Mike Kliss joins us now from the Kliss Cave in Dove Valley. The players and the media enjoying the cooler weather. Yeah. Uh, Mike, you just posted a story about uh, Brittany Bolin. We know the Bolin's time is almost to, uh, come to a close here with the Broncos, but uh, Brittany Bolin had a message for some people that she'd worked with for many years. Yeah, Brittany Bolin was uh, still working for the Broncos and a senior vice president of uh, strategy role. And she decided last month at uh, an employee staff awards day, she informed uh, the employees there that um, she was stepping away from the Broncos, wanted to make a, a clean break with the uh, Walter Penner group. The Bolin family has been in control of the Broncos for 38 years since Pat Bolin and his uh, brother and sister bought the team back in March 1984. It's been quite the run. But Brittany Bolin has resigned from her position with the Broncos. And, uh, I, you know, I, I guess she she didn't want – she's get, she's going to wind up with more than a half billion out of this sale, 11%. All the kids are going to get 11% of this $4.65 billion that uh, Rob Walton bought the team for. But trust me, in talking to Brittany over the years and just listening to her talk, she would have preferred a different outcome. She was hoping to one day succeed her father uh, as the controlling owner of the Broncos. Uh, she was working toward that. She's got all kinds of education, masters from Duke. She went to uh, um, 
a global marketing company to get some practical experience. She worked in the NFL office for two years across four different up departments, but it wasn't to be. She will wind up with a nice uh, cash ca consolation prize, but it's uh, the Bowling Group now essentially uh, is finished with the Broncos and you know Rob Walton and the, and the Penners will soon be in control. Couple of weeks. Now, this is day yep. two. We were all worked up yesterday, because I was. Sierra and the kids came out to camp yesterday, opening day, but she came back today. She did. You know, she is, um, she's been, whenever she's in town, which is, I, I guess, a, a pretty big if. She is busy. Uh, she's got her own record coming out, uh, or it has uh, come out. It's been released. So she has to do uh, all kinds of promotional things for that. But when she's in town, uh, her and her kids are very supportive of Russell Wilson. They're often together. What uh, the, the night before, they were at their uh, new clothing store in the, uh, uh, in the uh, mall uh, that's around the uh, area here. I forget which is the name of the mall. But... Uh, yeah, they're, they're often seen together. I mean, uh, rarely do I see them apart. And it does look like she's going to be a regular so long as she's in town. I'll tell you, they, they are the first family right now. And, and you just they the are. love and respect between them is pretty impressive. Well, she's a, she's a regular out at camp. We'll see how many days she does make it. Mike, we'll get a chance to talk to you more about today down at Bronco Camp coming up a little bit later at 5 o'clock. Thanks. This Saturday, the NFL will celebrate Back Together Saturday, and the Broncos are expecting a big crowd. Remember, they've been all dealing with COVID for a couple of years, so things are changing. Practice runs from 10 in the morning until noon. Parking will open at 8 and the gates at 9. It's free, but all the tickets have been reserved already. Uh, there will be everything from a welcome address from the players and the coaches, food trucks, autograph sessions, a flag giveaway to the first 5,000 there. Those ticket sales were capped at 4,000, and they are sold out. So. Big event. Have some Should be fun. Right now, monkeypox cases are growing across the country, including here in Colorado. So we're going to talk about vaccines. Our medical expert, Dr. Paul Coley, joins us next. Let's take a live look right now as we keep an eye around the state, looking for some more severe storms this afternoon and evening. There's a look right over the top at Coors Field at downtown. We'll be right back.